Hey, how's it going? My name's Mike Squires, and this is Couchress Podcast, episode number 174. And my guest, Justin Sullivan, the singer, front front man, and uh, lone founding member of uh, New Model Army, a band that has been going for four decades and um, doesn't get to the States a ton, but tours in Europe a lot in the UK. And, uh, man, I had a great time talking with Justin. He's got a solo album coming out uh, later this month, the week of this podcast release, actually, Um, 21 May 2021. So look for that, end of May 2021. Um, Yeah, what a life well lived. Uh, he seems to have have carved out for himself uh, one of seeming uh, seeming adventure and fearlessness, and just like propelled by you know wanting to. Well, you know, we make some jokes about freedom. He does, <laughs> and uh, uh, you'll see for yourself. I had a great time. I hope you enjoy. This conversation as much as I did. So if you are enjoying the Couchless podcast or the videos we're making, please, please, please support us at Patreon, patreon.com slash Couchless. Um, this is, you know, this is the one way that you can support us. I appreciate you watching and that that helps absolutely. Um, it's the one way that you can financially contribute and um you know, I've tiptoed around this, but honestly, like, in order to make the show better, to keep going, to focus energy on it, um, that's that's the only that's the only thing that makes it possible. So I I really appreciate the support. It's also the only place where you can download the audio for the videos that we do, all the cover songs, and I have plans on expanding the show touring the show, doing it in front of a live audience with a live band. Kind of like, uh, you know, cross between a podcast and a talk show sort of a thing. So if you'd like to see that happen, if you'd like to see it come to your town, well, um, please support us on Patreon. And buy a ticket when we come to your town. That would also really help. So thank you for for your support. I really appreciate it. Also, thank you to River City Guitars. River City Guitars is a great little guitar store in Spokane, Washington, at River City Guitars on social media and rivercityguitars.com on the web. Every day is a buying day. Please go check out uh, their website. If you've got a cool vintage used or boutique piece or collection, they will buy your whole collection. Uh, give them a shout, sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Tell them I sent you. Maybe include some pictures. And uh, my guy Bobby travels all over the country buying uh, every every day, every week, every month, every year. He's buying. So thank you, River City Guitars. It's also one of very few places where you will find this lovely guitar, the Marvin Guitars CN90, which I co-designed with Keith Horn over there at Marvin Guitars. And we designed that to celebrate the 100th episode. Uh, that's the joke. It's a C and an N. And it's a CN is Spanish for 100, right? CN90, because it's got a P90 pickup. I just let the cat out of the bag. Uh, so yeah, the CN90 is available at very few guitar stores. We only made four of them. I mean, I didn't make them. Keith did, you know. Um, You can find one at River City Guitars right now. And um, also the guitar shop in New York City, which is the La La Bella showroom. And uh, and my guy, Jimmy Carbonini, is building his guitars there. And Matt Gabs from the shows there. It's a real family affair. So if you find yourself in Spokane or you find yourself in New York or you're in the area, go check the guitar out. Go check those shops out. They're great. 
Um, we're going to get into the show now. So thanks for hanging in there. Thank you for the support. Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's fucking real easy, you know? Just don't be an asshole. Hello. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you all right. I can, Excellent. can you hear me? I can. I can hear you great. How you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? I'm well. It's, uh, you know, we got a Saturday morning here on the east coast of uh, the U.S. Where are you? I got all my, you know, morning beverages lined up here. It's like a parade of, uh, you know, hopefully no emergencies. And coffee, I'm, more coffee and coffee. Yeah, I got coffee and I got a big thing of water and I got a kale smoothie, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, how's your weekend? Um, okay. It's pouring with rain here. It's really, it's a real English May sort of uh, English May, uh, like, like last bank holiday we had. Um, pouring with rain and freezing cold. I'm from, you know, originally I'm from Seattle, and so I'm very well accustomed to <laughs> the, the climate there. And yeah, you know. where are you now? I live in the Hudson Valley of New York, up above okay. the city, a couple right. hours north. Uh, still uh, beautiful here, but uh, yeah, a different vibe for sure. Do you miss Seattle? Sometimes, sometimes I do, you know, um, I was there for many, many years. So I have, you know, all my friends are there. Right. And, uh, all, you know, a lot of my musical pies. And so I came out here, I knew very few people. So I haven't been able to, uh, why, why did you go to there? Well, I, I, uh, I love the way you, the tone in your voice. Why'd you go there? <laughs> I mean, I went to to brooklyn first which was a, a you know that was a whole thing like that's a yeah yeah like you move there when you're young you don't move there when you're 45 I, i'll be 50 this year you know it's like <laughs> the hell is yeah basically you know you move to big sit happening cities when you're young and then you move out yeah yeah where are you at um I was born in a little village not so far from London. Like everybody else, I moved to London when I was a kid, um, you know, to get a first, you know, job. And then then actually I spent, uh, uh, saved up a bit of money, went to America, spent months hitchhiking around North America in 1975 when I was a kid, lived in Belfast for a year. Then I came up to Bradford in Yorkshire to go to college. And uh, I dropped out of college after a year, but I've stayed here ever since. It's a strange city, Bradford. It's like a, it's a small, it's a small city that was a kind of 19th century boom town. Um, it went from nothing to, you know, a, a very rich city, which head for head was apparently the richest city in Europe in 1910. And then the bottom fell out of the wool trade. And now it's a very poor city. Um, uh, with a population, um, about a third of the population is Pakistani in, or in origin now, um, a quarter to a third. And but it's it has two redeeming features. One is that well, one is that it's quite small. It's three hundred thousand, which is you know nicely manageable. Secondly, it's surrounded by the beautiful Yorkshire countryside. Like Wuthering Heights is is fifteen mile, miles from here. Right. Um, you know, that wide open, big moorland, that's all around us. So it's easy to get out of the city. The other thing is because it's um, poor, it's incredibly cheap. So, you know, if we had, if we'd moved to London or somewhere like that, or even Leeds, which is just down the road, we'd have to worry about, you know, making money. Um, living in Bradford, you never have to worry about making money. Nothing costs anything. <laughs> so you know so it's a really good place to be based um, right. you know uh, i spend quite a lot of time in paris because my girlfriend's from there she's french and, and i spend quite a bit of time there but apart from that uh, Bradford, there, there are worse places in the world if you've got to live somewhere it, it's okay i think uh you know wherever you are your mindset is going to dictate how you get along there unless it's you know a particularly dangerous yeah i'm not 
I mean, people say, you know, Paris must be so wonderful after the awfulness of Bradford, but it does work the other way around too, that, that, <laughs> that, that I'm not really a big city guy. I, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be in big cities because I grew up in the country, but now I'm, I'm not really. Hey, uh, let me ask you this. Let's back up for a second. You said you hitchhiked across America in 1975. There's a, I don't know if you've, this interview is to do with the fact I've just made a solo album. There is a song on it called 19, 1975, um, which is me remembering that time. It was a really interesting time to be there. I think I hitchhiked about 30,000 miles. Um, and I was there several months. I ran out of money and was kind of, I was just sleeping rough and having adventures and, and, and wandering around and sort of the end of the hippie thing, I guess. The, the, but it was an interesting time to be there because it was after the end of the Vietnam War and the, you know, the civil rights movement of the 60s and the, the, the hippie movement of the 60s and all the political assassinations. And basically, it seemed to me like everybody in America was going. <sighs> right. And if you look at all the movies of that time, Vanishing Point, Zabriskie Point, they're all kind of bleached out and sepia. And the music of that time was a bit bleached out and sepia as well, which is probably why punk rock had to happen. But the it was that kind of uh, melancholic, burned out, exhausted um, sense everywhere uh, that I've, I've always found quite appealing. I like things that are bleak. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it was a really interesting, like I said, really interesting time to be there. I had, I had various adventures like you would, you know, if you have no money and you're just wandering. You're, uh, and at this time you're 18, 19, 20 years old, something like this? 19, yeah. Yeah. Wow, what a, what a, what a time and what an adventure. You were on your own or were you traveling? Yeah, I was on I've, uh, I've met companions for a day or two from time to time, but right. most of I was on my own. I mean, Americans are, uh, I think it's the nature of the country, the extraordinarily generous. One of the things about the, one of the pluses about American culture is it's very, very generous and hospitable. So, of course, I would be hitchhiking and, and somebody would say, where are you sleeping? I'd say, I'm sleeping out. And they'd say, come home with me. And, and um, of course, you know, that can lead to uh, problems, but it sure. mostly didn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, it's obviously different being a man from being a woman in that situation. Although, you know, that's a, I don't know. I was never, I was never, I was utterly fearless. Right. I mean, I think about it now. I think I hitchhiked through the back, back side of uh, New York City at three o'clock in the morning. You know, um, it was hitchhiking through Queens at three right. o'clock in the morning. I, you know, that kind of innocence you have at that age. Uh, what about, I mean, cities are one thing, but what about the spaces between cities in America in 1975 for a fellow like yourself? Uh, yeah. Did you have the, long the, hair? The spaces, yeah. The spaces between cities are big. I had long hair, but by 1975, that wasn't uncommon, even in, you know, Texas and Mississippi and everywhere else sure. by that point. Um, and I was English. So in a way, you're both in your own feeling about where you are and with the people you meet, there are allowances made for the fact you're not from there. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it's not like you had a Russian a, accent. If I meet a foreigner here in Bradford. I don't have the same, you know what I mean? I don't expect them necessarily to understand the rules or, you know, but, but generally, speaking, generally speaking, people are welcoming and hospitable to strangers. In general, in life, they are. I mean, one of the great, one of the great gifts you can give to a child, I think, is the, the, the idea that, um, you know, the world is basically benign, that people are basically okay, um, that uh, strangers are usually helpful and kind, um, 
and that is generally true it was true then it's still true now but we've lived we've we've allowed a culture to develop where children are brought up to to fear everything that's out there um that um that the, the world is intent is in, inherently dangerous and that other people are inherently untrustworthy in my experience this really is not true it can be true you know you've got chances of meeting your chances of meeting somebody um bad a predator there are those chances but they're small instead we with you know we've we've developed this kind of culture especially true in the united states where everybody's terrified of everybody else i i, I remember being there a few years ago and and it was in a, a big car park in the middle of the day in broad open daylight quite a lot of people around and i this guy parked up and he got out of his car and i approached him from a distance and said excuse me i'm looking for a post office um, is there a post office around here? And he looked at me with utter terror and got immediately back in his car. I think that's terribly sad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and in America, you're as likely to have a fatal, you know, interaction, like a, a violent and fatal interaction with your neighbor rurally living as with a oh come on yeah i mean this is this is you know this is well documented that you know everybody has uh, you know gun culture in america is is on the basis i need to protect my property um you know the chances are 90 percent you're more if you've got a gun in your home you're more likely to make, use it on a member of your family than anybody else you know i grew up in that house <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that's true. I grew up in that house. I remember. I remember in my early years um, uh, in Bradford, um, growing up in kind of on the fringes of uh, gang culture, and and I always had one. There was one rule. I said, like, "I'm not living in any house that's got firearms." Right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So when you you got back from the states did you did you travel abroad further or when i went to live in well i've always traveled quite a lot I, I, after i got back from the states i lived in belfast for a year at the height of the troubles so there's another song on the album i mean the, the album is much more autobiographical oh than than what i usually do there's a song called 28th of may which is my a couple of years ago we played in belfast with the band and i had a chance to stay after the show for a few days and um, look over my old haunts and where I used to live and work and stuff. And I ended up writing a lot about the city in this little notebook. And then when I was sat on my sofa last April and starting to work on a solo album for the lack of anything else to do, um, I went through the notebooks and I found all this stuff about Belfast. So, I've, so you know, that comes. I mean, I... How on earth did you land in Belfast at the most dangerous time uh, in I history? Just was a, I was offered a job working there, and I thought, oh, this could be interesting. So I went, <laughs> and it was interesting. I fell in love with the city. I, I love the city. I love the people. You know, the, the terrible, it's cursed by this ter the cur terrible curses of history and polarization of two inherently delightful communities. <laughs> who's uh, right. in a kind of cold war with each other which was hot at the time i uh, uh if i have to see another fucking national flag draped anywhere i'll be sick i i you know i especially feel that in britain at the moment which is now it's like you know boris johnson is a kind of user um the trump textbooks of of how to mobilize a kind of uh, undereducated population into doing um, what the people with uh, all the power and all the money want, um, you know, backing them up. Or an well, easy way is to uh, wave a flag. I mean, what's happened is that Western democracy has morphed into oligarchy. So the idea of democracy is that we represent, uh, we we elect representatives to defend us against powers that exist within society there these are our representatives to make sure that we are treated 
you know, equally under the law that we have opportunities that we that we have protection from, etc. Well, and then there's a word uh, represent. You're supposed to yeah. represent the people. Yeah, mem- represent the people and protect us. But the trouble is, they've morphed into the same oligarchs. So basically, um, you know, th- th- this is this is uh, turned into something else altogether, and. And what's happened is that people feel this. They, they you know, they, basically since the 1980s, there was this thing there where, um, where under you know Reagan and Thatcher, this sort of counter revolution against social democracy that had been developing through the 20th century, counter revolution saying you must free people with money should be free to do what they want with their money, right. This means screw everybody else with their power and money. And as I said, our representatives are meant to prevent this from happening. Um, and it stopped happening. So now we're all being screwed. Because as they and say, people feel, is for and, sale. <laughs> and people feel that the only way, the only way in which uh, people can seem to be able to organize to resist the power of Amazon and Apple and Google and, and all the rest of them um, is either extreme religion and the other one is extreme nationalism, both of which are utterly terrifying. Um, I'm not a big but, club guy. Yeah, well, right. And neither <laughs> am I. I mean, we're all deserters. I mean, most people actually are probably like you and me. They don't want to, they're not into all these various agendas, but we're, but there are these, you know, sides being drawn up, you know, ah, it's terrifying. And, and the extreme nationalism, you would think after two centuries of all those bloody wars, especially in Europe, that we'd, we'd have learned by now where this nationalist rhetoric ends up. Right. But we don't seem to have done. No, not, not very well. We haven't, we haven't dealt with that. You know, the whole principle of nation states, I mean, they're, 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 they're new, they're new inventions. They've only been around a few centuries. Um, they're ludicrous. So how long were you in Belfast? A year. That's a long, I bet that was a long and, uh, you know, exciting. Oh, you're on the edge of your seat. I was very happy there. I, was, I you know, I mean, one terrible thing happened, which is in, in, in the song that I wrote about it. But uh, generally speaking, um, I love the city, love the people. And so then you went back to back to London. Well, no, I went then. I went to somewhere where I'm not from, which is Bradford. Um, I went to. Go, I came up here to go to college. I quickly fell in love with town. Um, I wasn't very interested in sitting in a classroom studying, so I dropped out of college. I met uh, a person called Jules Denby who at the time was married to a hell's angel. Uh, we started a relationship and, and she, she was an extraordinary creative person. She's been a novelist and a poet and an artist and now is a tattooist as well as all those things. And we, we had a relationship which didn't last very long, but we basically continued to live together. And I was, you know, had, it, had a band and she kind of, one of those people that makes things happen, she took the band I was in and sort of pushed me in a certain direction um, with that band. And that band eventually, you know, turned into New Model Army, which has been now running 40 years. Um, Let me back up for a second. Did you say you started a relationship with a, a woman who was married to a Hell's Angel? Yeah. Yeah, but they were kind of getting <laughs> They were, well, he was he was a very sweet man, um, yeah. and he he was always very understanding of me, and and you know the divorce was quite amicable, um, but it did mean that I hang out with that gang for a little bit, and it, uh, yeah, whatever. I mean, I I've always like I don't know why I'm not drawn to this particularly, but I always seem to end up in this. It's like in 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 seven about two or three years later, I ended up working for the Pakistani mafia in Bradford driving a van over to Pakistan. Um, and that did end up badly with um, the person that I got on best with in that gang was was killed. Um, and I, I got out of that. Um, 
it's not that I'm, I, I, I always, like I say, I always think you can move through the world without being too worried. Right. Don't do, you know, I try not to do stupid things. I don't go around offending people or, or just, dis, you know, disobeying basic rules of human behavior. Um, wow. So, and through all this time, were you making music? Like during the time you hitchhiked across America, had you already been no, a music making person? No, not, not at all. I became a musician sort of by accident. I, I loved, when I was a kid, I remember there, was, there were two boats out in the North Sea that would broadcast pop music into the UK when the BBC was barely doing it. Right. Um, and this was an amazing time for music. On one side of the Atlantic, you had the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, the Who, the, you know, that British explosion. On the other side of the Atlantic, you've got Tamla Motown and, and Atlantic Soul. And, and Motown in particular remains my first love of, in, in music. So I grew up, and then I had older brothers and sisters that were always bringing records into the house. So there was lots and lots of music around. Um, and I, I sort of... <laughs> Just, it made sense of the world to me when nothing else did. Still does. And and then I learned a few chords on a guitar when I was 14. Wasn't serious about it. And then when I came to, you know, I could play a couple of songs, but I wasn't serious. And, and then when I came to Bradford, um, I was helping out a, a youth club. And there was a little youth club band that couldn't play at all. But there was one kid that was had a Mozart-like musical talent, literally, um, that played, well, he played anything he picked up. And I was the first person he'd ever met that could play chords. And so we, we used to just sit down and play together. Yeah. And then for, we started a couple of bands. Um, and bit by bit, I started writing and I found that you know, I'm not a gifted singer. I'm not a. I'm no. I'm no guitarist, even still. Um, but I can write, and I. So I started writing. He he could play anything. He became the bass player, and you, and 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 I I didn't get punk rock when it first happened. Maybe because I was still into the kind of you know the remainder of the hippie thing. The northern soul scene was kind of big in in the northern England when I was here. I used to go to this club called Wigan Casino which was these kind of all night, starting at midnight, dance till eight o'clock in the morning, take uppers, dance all night. Um, sort of pre-rave, pre rave, but the music was better. Um, <laughs> and I, the, 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 so I was really into that. And when punk rock happened, I, I didn't really get it. I, and I remember my little brother sat down and played me the first Clash album. And I went, Okay, but at the same time, he played me television Marquee Moon album, and I and that one really grabbed me yeah, more. Than that album. It's an interview. The two things really happened. One was an interview I heard on the radio with Polystyrene. When I suddenly got it, it's you know this. It was the whole punk thing was basically a cultural revolution, which reaffirmed that the principle of doing anything was the spirit with which you did it and it didn't matter about the expertise it didn't matter about the form it didn't matter about anything else it was all about transmission of spirit and energy then i got it and then there was one concert i saw in 1979 by the ruts probably best known for babylon's burning and i it was a little bit before babylon's burning came out but i'd heard in a rut on john peel and I knew I wanted to go to this concert. And it was 200 people in the back room of a pub in Bradford on a freezing cold night. And me and Jules went down. And, um, and in that gig, they were an extraordinary band. The three musicians had all been around a little bit. And so they were really technically great musicians. And the front man was the most charismatic front man I've ever seen. Sort of. He didn't care at all. At the same time, he cared deeply. You know, that kind of thing. Perfect. Some people have just got. And in the gig was like everything that was 
scary and brilliant and thrilling and and angry and beautiful and everything about being alive and i sort of walked out of the gig feeling like my whole insides have been kind of cleaned out completely cathartic and I, so i was in a band with stuart at the time and i went that's what we should do that's it so the ruts was a kind of template for how how i felt that night was a kind of template for what new model army became um in order you know in order to make people feel the way i felt that night but musically obviously everything that happening punk was around us you know stuart was as a musician very influenced by jean-jacques bonnell um I was still listening to lots of Northern Soul and um, and the Roots and, and and everything really, and we just took all these various different musical influences, went down to a stripped down three piece, and maybe because of my Northern Soul thing, I always understood from day one that the most important member of every band is the bass player and the drummer. It doesn't really fucking matter about the others, you know. If the bass and drummer are great, you've got a great band. And Stuart was a great bass player, and, and basically I could write and let him be free. And then Robert Heaton was the third drummer we had. He joined in 82, but he was an extraordinary musician. He could play guitar and bass. And, um, and after Stuart left, crazy, crazy decision by him, um, I started writing with Robert and, and we went off in all these various different directions. I mean, Robert came from different musical background from me, but, um, and everybody that's ever been in New Model Army has come from a different place, which I quite like. You know, you look at the current band, Michael's a kind of rock guy, really. Marshall's a blues man. Dean's a 60s psychedelia man. Kerry, our bass player, is a metalhead. Um, I'm a Northern Soul guy. You know, the, and we, I remember having a conversation around a uh, table with a slightly different version of the band but the same principle where we tried to agree on one album in the history of music that we all unreservedly loved and we couldn't agree on one really I think that's strange for a band i you know that the, we all really come from different places and then so what we do is take not a, a single album not a single album that we could agree on that we unreservedly loved. Wow. And, I, and I think that's unusual for a band. So what we make is this kind of hybrid taking all these different influences of different things. And so we got this band that, you know, is it punk? Well, no, it's not really punk. Can it, but we play punk festivals. Is it metal? Well, no, it's not, but we seem to have influenced some metal bands and we play metal festivals. Is it goth? No, it's not really, but we play goth festivals. Is it folk? Um, people say, you know, it's folk rock. Well, we play folk festivals, but it's not, you know, it's kind of everything and nothing. Right. We take in all these different influences and make what we make. And it's wonderful not belonging to a genre. You know, we have an audience which is kind of drawn from all different places and they all like different things as well. They've just gone with us on this long journey. And quite early on, we, you know, we had quite a bit of success in the, the, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, but we, we always had this thing about never letting a song get bigger than the band. So if a song started to get bigger than the band, we just stopped playing it for five years. You know, <laughs> that, way, that way we've managed to take an audience with us on the journey. And we never became, you know, people say in the early 90s, you're on the edge of being a really big band. What went wrong? And I think uh, I can think of lots of things that went wrong. Um, and mostly we shot ourselves in the foot. So we never became quite a big band. We became this weird sort of worldwide cult band with enough of an audience to sustain us while we do what we want which is, you know, what went wrong? Well, here we are in 2021 after 41 years where we basically make whatever music we like uh, in the way we like, 
play in the way we like, do what we, <laughs> something went right. You know. That's what I would say. Uh, let me ask you this. Before you started writing music, as a younger person, were you drawn to uh, writing poetry or writing stories or anything in school? I don't know, I like all teenagers, I think I tried to write poetry. Right. I, uh, <laughs> uh, not really. I think it was meeting Jules, really, that, that uh, I mean, she was already writing, but, but we sort of encouraged each other quite a lot. Yeah. In that sense. I mean, we lived in a house with, other writers and, and and other musicians and poets in particular um, everybody was creating it was that time you know we didn't we, no one had any money no one cared um, we had this huge dilapidated house in Bradford full of you know writers and artists and people doing stuff um, uh, but writing right is in my my dad's side of the family my dad wrote my grandfather my my father was born in canada my grandfather who very sadly i never met he died before i was born um but he was in love with the wide open snowy wastes of canada um and he he traveled a lot in canada he was an engineer and a miner and um uh, he um, he wrote uh, some novels and short stories about you know Inuit and and the, the snowy wastes of Canada, and I think these informed me as a, as a child. I'm terribly drawn to to bleak, snowy, cold, open places. Yeah. Interest. So you're like 21 before you focus on music and writing 22 23 i mean new malami we start in 1980 80 new malami start 1980 so uh, like i said i was in a couple of bands with stuart before that but we i started to get serious 1980 i was 24 i was already quite old it's interesting because i mean people like now i mean i'm 50 like thinking that 24 is old seems ridiculous to me but most people who make a go of it and you know like they've already at at 24 they've got eight or ten years behind them but you're right you're right it was it for me it was just an accident really i just met first stuart then jules then robert and all of them were exceptional people now i look back i didn't realize it at the time but they they were all exceptional talents in different ways outside of the community in this home where you were living this house what was the like the punk community like this is 1979 79 80 81 82 there was a there was a bit of yeah there was a we there was a community in Bradford of people you know doing stuff um you know some some went on to have very successful careers some didn't um you know yeah. out of that group of people uh, and we all, but we, I think we all, like a lot of people from that time, we all held on to the ethic, mostly anyway. Right. I mean, you know, other people that passed through the house, like I say, several poets, a couple of them turned into quite successful writers. Um, Ian Asprey was there with us for a while. Um, uh, Akinawa's it was in a band with Ian Asprey at the beginning, Southern Death Cult, which turned into the cult, which then you know, right. Um, Akinawa's was the drummer, he's uh, you know, Pakistani origin. He went on to form Nation Records and a band called Fundamental. Um, and and we're still good friends, actually. He there's a song on the album about him called Akistan, and um, but we're, we're still good friends. He, he spends quite a lot of time in Pakistan, also in London, also in Bradford. Um, and has had a really interesting career just again just that idea of doing stuff making stuff is it successful so, you know we've all had moments when we've had a kind of uh, you know we've all had 15 minutes dotted around here and there of being successful and in the in the press and other times when we haven't but it doesn't seem to matter 
Right. So when you're prepping, you're like getting songs together and rehearsing the band. Uh, did the sort of spirit of doing rather than perfecting uh, propel I you? We were trying to perfect. I mean, we were just beginners. Right. But there is a, there is a kind of thing is how does a band form? I, mean, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. How does a band form? Well, basically, somebody meets somebody else that can play something, and you get into a room and you start playing together, and you think, "This is great." Right. You love it, and you're trying to create something that you think is great. And forty-one years later, it's basically the same. <laughs> Nothing's really changed. You know, I get in a in a room, you know, now with different principal partners, but I get in a room and we try to make something we think is great. And that's it. That's it. Do you remember the first, sh like the first show that you played and, and what that felt like? Vaguely. I, I, I overcome with an absolute wave of adrenaline, I think. You know, were I'm sure. You, uh, was... Were you nervous, or yeah, were you I mean, excited to be there. It, it, I'm sure you're nervous. One of the things about punk again is that a lot of it was um, framed in terms of anger. Well, to start with, there was a lot to be angry about in the early Thatcher years, um, especially in the north of England. I mean, it was impossible to live here and not be a little bit political. Um, and I, by nature, you know, grown up with the idea of politics and stuff. So I, I was very like that. The other thing, of course, is if you're terribly nervous, um, the, the way to focus that those nerves, anger is perhaps the easiest. Right. And, and, and it's like everybody I know that plays in uh, inverted commas, an angry band, we outside of that we we tend to after a number of years anyway tend to be quite easygoing people because we have the perfect outlet for it right. the, the people that get fucked up are people in pop bands and comedians who have to smile when they feel terrible inside if all you have to do is go on stage and be angry that's not difficult you no. know it's, you know, comedians uh, are historically you know, some of the darkest, most... Yeah, it's easy to be dark. Um, and I always find at the beginning of tours these days that I start a tour full of my own demons, um, uh, whether they're within me or external in the world, which you can find plenty. Sure. Um, and you go... Whoa! And it's a great personal catharsis, and it's also a catharsis for the people that come. Um, but actually, after doing it for a number of weeks, I'm pretty empty inside. I haven't got much of that. Then what happens is you take it off the audience because the audience come with all this stuff inside and you can feel it. And, and then you kind of take it off them and give it back. And so there's this kind of exchange that happens. What what was your very first tour like? And when you finally came back to the States for the first time with the band, um, what, I mean, you had a decidedly different experience. You were touring and uh, playing shows and not hitchhiking, I assume. Um, what, tell me about that, like your first couple tours. Um, I can't really remember in England. I mean, in England, we, you know, we'd get in a van and go somewhere and play a gig and come back. Uh, and then it was, you know, go somewhere for more than one day. It was uh, go, go out for three days or, or yeah, you know, like, like, like everyone. Exciting. Um, and I, I remember those early years, you know, you, you, you've got this, suddenly you've got this kind of lifestyle opens up in front of you. Um, but I do remember the first time we were left England, we played in, we, we had a, two weeks in Scandinavia or something. Um, and I did all those things that, that you kind of do. It's like suddenly you're, 
you're free from life, you're surrounded by um, drugs and free alcohol. Um, I remember, you know, I did a bottle of whiskey a day for a week in Norway. Um, and, at the, and, and it was all wild and great and fabulous. And after the end of the week, I played like shit. I felt like shit. And I thought, uh, I'm not really enjoying this. I think I've done that. I'm not going to do it again. So I never really ever went back to that, you know, thing of excess for the sake of excess. Yeah, like I say, my rock and roll... After a week? Exactly. My rock and roll years lasted approximately a week. I did it. At the end of it, I didn't feel good. And more to the point, I was couldn't play or sing in the way that I wanted to. And that really bothered me. You know, you, you, you have everybody that's been in New Model Army has always had a kind of quite a level of personal pride in themselves as people that can do something, whether it be, you know, the technical side of playing or put something across. And if you if you have a bad gig because it's not happening for you that night, the feeling at the end of that gig is terrible. Yeah. You feel like shit. You feel like you haven't done what you should be doing. And it's a sense of personal disappointment that means that the next day you're going to go, I'm going to go to bed early tonight. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know what I mean? It's that sense of pride in what you're doing, I think. That we've never had any of those, you know, periods of excess where, where musicians go completely off the rails for months or even years. Because, because maybe just out of a sense of personal pride. I, I remember in coming to America where well, we had our first tour of America and we couldn't get visas. And we got this famous letter which has gone into mythology from back from the visa department saying, um, this band has no artistic merit. Uh, <laughs> now, I cannot believe anyone in the State Department sat down and listened to the, to the, to the music. But um, I... <laughs> I think maybe they didn't like the name or something. I, it did mean that when we did The Ghost of Cain in, in 1986, um, that Glyn Johns, of all people, who we were working with, uh, um, ended up writing a letter for us going, I, I, Glyn Johns, which is very Glyn thing to write, producer of Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, blah, 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 ad infinitum, um, consider that this band does have artistic merit. Um, uh, we've still got that letter somewhere too. And we did get visas eventually, um, and we came to America. I remember the first tour, it was in December, it was freezing cold. Our bus broke down somewhere in the, between Toronto and Chicago, or so. I can't remember. Anyway, in the frozen wastes of Canada, we broke down. Uh, we had no power. We sat on the bus freezing, wrapped up in all the coats we could find. Wow. And we were rescued by Metallica's light crew, who happened <laughs> to be passing at the time, uh, hailed on a CB radio by our driver. And we were rescued. And then we did the rest of the tour by flying, I think. I got really ill. I got pneumonia. I was cold. Wow. Uh, and uh, the the And then we went back and we... But we had sort of, uh, we've always had sort of problems with America. There seems to be two ways to, for a, for a, an outside band to do America. Um, one is to have the weight and money of big, powerful record company behind you. Right. We never really had that. We were signed, because we were with EMI in the UK, we were signed to Capital in America, but they were never that interested. Um, and later on, around the time of the Love of Hope is Causes, we signed to Sony because American uh, Sony told us that they thought that this album, Love of Hope is Causes, was going to be a massive hit in America. And we they were going to put lots of weight behind it. It was going to be great. And that's the reason we signed to them. And then in between us signing and actually making the album, there was an internal dispute between Epic America, which is part of Sony, and, um, and Epic London, um, where they fell out. And the American company decided not to promote anything coming from London. 
it was nothing to do with us personally, but we got caught in the crossfire of this. Um, and it'd be a lot uh, more fun if it was personal. Sorry, it'd be a lot more fun if it was personal. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't personal. But that was the sort of disaster we had in 1993. Um, and then we stopped going for a long time. And then in the in the zeros, um, we started coming. We put a foot back in the water. I came over with Dean. We did a kind of little semi-acoustic tour. It was great. We brought the band back. It was pretty good. Um, but the problem was that that we had an audience in some cities, you know, Seattle, Seattle New York, but barely enough um, to, to pay for it. The other way you do America, of course, is get in a van and drive. But, right. the, but the problem with doing that is that you can do that for months and you can perhaps make inroads. But that means you, you're not doing the rest of the world and Europe where we were very much in demand. And, and also you kind of don't write because you're on the road and you're tired. You need the time it's off. It's to drive that much. It's really fatiguing. It is. And um, we didn't mind that side of it. And particularly me, I, I'm, I'm kind of road friendly. I, I like driving and stuff. But it does mean that, you, you know, we never write on the road. You're far too tired to really write songs. Um, and, you know, we didn't have those months. Um, but anyway, in the, in the 2000s, we started coming back. And then we had quite an a, a ambitious tour for the, the High album, which was came out at the height of the George Bush era war on terror. We applied for our work permits. We never got them. Not because they were, um, not because we were refused, just because it was caught in such a backlog of what, what, what was and what wasn't allowed. that They just never came through. We had to cancel a whole tour, lost a fortune. And at that point we went, oh, bloody America. <laughs> You know, and we know we got people there that loved the band and, and we would love to come back and stuff. Um, we came back in nine, 2009, did a tour that wasn't particularly successful. 2010 was our 30th anniversary and we had our work permits from the year before still with one month left on them. So we came into Brooklyn. We did two shows in Brooklyn to celebrate the 30 years of the band and came home again. It was the only time we've ever been to America and not lost money. And uh, and that and now, last year was the 40th anniversary of the band. We thought, and we've done very well in Europe over the last 10 years, especially. Um, and we thought we need to go to America. So we did have vague plans, and then the pandemic hit. So obviously, we didn't. And we do think, you know, we'll come back at some point in some shape or other somehow. Right. And if nothing else, I'll definitely come back with a guitar. And would your work permits, work permits for the United States are a very expensive, and secondly, it's a bit of a lottery. Is that right? Uh, oddly enough, I have, you know, because I have visas to Europe, UK. I've tra you know I've traveled all over playing music. The hardest place for me to go is Canada. Like they, pull me, I've had, I've, I've, I've basically become just a layer of cotton away from getting a cavity search in Canada. Because uh, I also, you know, have problems with authority at times, especially if I feel like I'm being harassed, and then that never goes well when you, <laughs> the, the people with the badges. I remember one tour we got, it was the other, going the other way. We had the problem coming across from Winnipeg into the states. And we basically got mugged at the border by by the US authorities. Right. I remember they, first of all, they said to our tour manager, we, I mean, we were just in a van, it was kind of low budget tour. They said to our just tour manager, you know, what do you got in here? And we had some CDs and they were made in America, but technically we were importing them back into America. So they had impounded them all or something. And it was like, oh, they said, you can appeal. You can come back on Monday and appeal. And we went, well, we're, by Monday, we'll be in Minneapolis. You know, it's right. like, no way. So we lost all that. And then, and then they said, how much cash have you got on you? And he said, I don't know, about $12,000. And they demanded to see it and count it. 
and it turned out he had thirteen thousand dollars so they then tried to prosecute him for false declaration it was like that it was kind of just crazy right what year do do, do this fucking band let's do this fucking band so they did yeah. uh what year is this is this uh that's 2008 right we're, st we're yeah we're still uh warring on terror in 2000 War warring on terror <laughs> <laughs> you know we hadn't built a wall yet or hadn't started working oh, on building a wall yet but good fucking god yeah um so when the pandemic hit and everything sort of came to a screeching halt uh you posted up at home and you started writing yeah, everybody said at the beginning of the first, I remember the first few days of the pandemic, there's going to be a lockdown, lockdown. And I remember and then somebody said to me, you'll write a solo album. And I went, no, I won't. I've got no intention of doing that. Right, because we're going to be, it's like two or three weeks, right? We didn't think it was going to be. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I was sat on the sofa at home with a guitar, nothing to do. And one of the, re you know, I made a solo album in 2001, two, 2002. And uh, everybody said, you know, you know, you should make a follow-up. And I always thought, yeah, one day I will. But especially in recent years, um, uh, yeah, can you give me 20 minutes? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things is my first loyalty to the band. Uh, you know, my first loyalty has got to be with my bandmates. So if I say I'll make a solo album, guys, it'll take me three months. Don't worry, I'll be back. I know it won't. Experience tells me it'll take a year and then I'll be touring it and blah, 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 blah. So, and, and New Model Army over the last 10 years especially has been in a really good place. We've been, you know, making interesting records. We've had quite a lot of success. Um, and, and we're on a bit of a roll. We're a very cohesive unit. And I don't want to interrupt that. So I thought, well, I won't. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. And then this happened. The band ground to a halt. Um, you know, obviously we weren't going to do last year was the 40th anniversary of the band and we had lots of, you know, 40th anniversary things planned that we only to be honest, we only half wanted to do anyway because it's like a bit boring, you know, being asked to look back over your 40 years all the time is kind of a bit dull but uh, we had all those plans and none of them could happen so yeah, I just started writing and 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 basically the way we write in the band has been the same for many years, which is that we, we, I mean, I've, I always tell the same story to everybody, but it's basically how we work is we collect musical ideas. So this can be especially drum beats. Michael will play loads and loads of interesting beats and, and you know, put them there and, and then you can make loops from them bass lines, a bit of a jam we've done in a sound check, a chord sequence, a melody you think of when you're walking down the street and you go na, 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 into your phone. Um, and this goes into a cupboard marked musical ideas. Um, and then, like all writers, I've always got a notebook, so I read a story, something happens, I read something, somebody, you know, I, I go to a place that interests me, I get impressions i write stuff and this goes into another cupboard called stuff i want to write about and then you just wait till the cupboards are full and these days they mostly are full all the time and then you go right now we've got some weeks or months and now we're going to write an album and you so i've just started doing this with new model army we got together a, a few weeks ago my um and started pooling ideas and it's easy you basically pull out drum beat we usually start with drums i usually i like to start with drums because singer songwriter stuff gets a bit boring um and i and i know that the rhythm section is by far the most important thing so start with the drum beat pull out that chord sequence that's interesting what does that feel like go through the lyric ideas feels a bit like that pull out something write a song it's always rubbish throw it away, <laughs> pull out another one. And then, but because that you're never staring at a blank sheet of paper because there's all this stuff. Right. So, and then when I, with the pandemic, um, I thought, oh, I'm going to write a song. 
So I'm sat there with a guitar and I come up with a chord sequence I like and I go, yeah, what does that feel like? Oh, there's that idea. And I write a song. And then, and quite quickly, once you get into that world of, it's like an imaginary abstract world full of landscapes and people and stories, then things snowball and you're drawing less on stuff you've got in storage and more on stuff that's actually happening in your head. And, and things start to snowball. And I usually, so writing for me is usually comes in waves. I have months when I don't write anything at all. And then weeks when I just go bang, 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 bang. Right. So is the reaching the destination of a complete song with the band and reaching the destination of completing a song that is a solo thing, are there different types yeah. of satisfaction for you because the journey is different? No, the satisfaction is kind of the same. But with the band, I often start with ideas for the band. I do a lot of the writing alone, but I usually have to have, I have to have at least one partner that I'm bouncing ideas off because yeah. I have a lot of ideas and sometimes I don't know which the good ones are and bad ones are. So... I need someone to bounce off all the time. I need someone that listens because I don't listen. I imagine and then chuck stuff. Right. And, and sometimes I imagine because I've got a real feeling about something. I imagine that's what's there. And it's not, it's just my imagination. <laughs> so I need someone that actually listens to what I'm doing and go, uh, yes, no. And with the band, it's Michael Dean in particular, everybody in the band, but especially Michael. We have a very good, I like working with drummers. It was Robert before him. Um, so I, I have this kind of relationship with him where I'm working, you know, often starting with his ideas, a drum beat or something, and then I write something and then I'm going somewhere and he comes in and listens to what I'm doing, goes, yeah, great. Why don't you take it there? Or no, that doesn't work. Why don't you try this? Um, and that works really well for me. So I'm bouncing off him all the time with the knowledge that then when there's a rough semblance of a song, then it comes back to all of us. So everybody's throwing their oar into that song. But as it often starts with bass and drums, that's kind of there. Um, and then we work together on it. With solo... It started with me and a guitar, and often people have said to me, you know, you should do a, an album like an early Bob Dylan album or a Nebraska album or something where it's just you and a guitar. Right. You know, your first solo album I did was full of other musical ideas um, by the guy I did the first solo album with was a, a TV film music producer and a, an all-round classically composed musician. So he kind of composed lots of music around my songs. Um, this time I did start, I just recorded me and a guitar at home. There's the song. And very quickly, I was very bored of it. Partly because I'm no guitarist, really. You know, it's a tool for writing with me. Secondly, I sing, but I, I it's a strange thing, but I don't know if you, you do you sing? I mean, I'm not a great singer. But, but when you listen to your voice, it's when I listen to my voice, I can't hear it. Right. It's like that. It's almost as if, you know, what am I getting from, my, from the vocal performance? Nothing. I don't, you know, I'm putting across the words I wanted to write. I'm just singing. Is it good or not? I don't know. Um, you know, what am I receiving from it? Nothing, because it's me. It's like it doesn't exist because it's me. So then I very quickly wanted to have some other music on the album. I didn't want to go down the, you know, bass and drums route. I wanted, you know, much more organic, abstract music. So like the solo album, I wanted double bass. Um, and I, the, the, on the first solo album, there's a, a, a bassist called Danny Thompson, who's incredibly famous in that world of jazz and folk and He's played with everybody. Um, and 
I wrote to him and I said, you know, would you play bass? And he said, yeah. And I was very excited about this. But because of the pandemic, I couldn't see him. Um, he started working. But the thing is, he's now 82. And he's not in great health. Wow. And, and he didn't feel he could. Uh, he wasn't feeling it anyway. And he was struggling physically. So then... Uh, I eventually, I kept trying, <laughs> I really wanted him to do it because uh, he is one of the world's greatest musicians, literally. Um, uh, but then I, I know of a, fr uh, a friend of mine is a sort of Danny Thompson protege, grew up listening to Danny, studied Danny. Um, he's played in a lot of bands, probably best known for the band Lamb, but he's also been in a lot of jazz, you know, and folk mm -hmm. outfits. Um, called John Thorne. So I wrote to him, said, would you play? And he went, yeah, I always wanted to play on your first solo. <laughs> you know, I love your first solo album. It would be an honour. So he played bass. I, Kerry, who's our bass player um, in the Model Army, his brother is the harp player in Florence and Machine. So, and, and he's played with us a couple of times. So, and he's a good friend. So I wrote to him and he played harp. Um, I have three composer friends, all of whom live in Germany, to, uh, Tobias Unterberg, who's a cellist, but composes a lot of um, music for various things. Um, uh, uh, Henning Nugel, who's a, a violinist, really, but does an awful lot of, actually does an awful lot of games music. He's a composer. And Shiran Yinon, who we've, we've had as a, uh, a violin player playing with New Model Army on an occasional basis over the last three, four years, who's another composer. Her father's um, was a conductor of the Berlin Symphony Orchestra and stuff. She, she's kind of grown up with it, an amazing composer, an amazing violin player. So I wrote to them, said, you know, throw me some ideas. So they all did. And all the way through last year, um, I was receiving by email ideas for you know parts for these songs that i'd written and then at the end of the process i always intended to go to lee smith who makes the last three new model army albums who we've got a great relationship with to mix it um and when we finally got in the studio last year in november um because he was extraordinarily busy last year mixing records because although the live side of music was dead the studio side of music was very active um and then we had three ways to go with this album one was to strip it all away go back to nebraska um go back to me and a guitar two was to use the the musical contributions we had from everybody but keep them very organic and keep the singer-songwriter thing. So the vocal's very loud. It, it's, you know, it's a singer-songwriter with all these kind of musical backdrops to give, give a kind of world of the imagination, but in a very organic way. Or three, take the music that we, we had, process it, make a really modern sounding processed studio record where we, you know, used a lot of tricks, where we built in lots of dynamics, where we processed everything. You know, you could, I could imagine making a record like that. And in the end, we decided on number two, to keep it very organic, keep it very simple, but to use all these great, you know, musicians on it. And everybody in, you know, I'm pleased to say that everybody in New Model Army, all, all the other four guys in New Model Army also, you know, they're, they're all there on there somewhere. So there's quite a lot of different musicians. Yeah, amazing. So what is the vibe in the UK for live music? Have have gigs started at all? Because there are, you know, of course, across America, each state has different regulations. Often states are at odds. The UK, the UK did handled the early part of the, the, the pandemic very badly. Uh, so we had a very high death rate here. Um, but they took a big gamble on being, unveiling a very ambitious and early vaccination program. 
um, and the organization of this national health system we have here, which is amazing, um, has meant that this has rolled out pretty fast. So in theory, in Britain, all regulations end on the 21st of June. Whether this actually happens, right. we don't know. Whether uh, there are, have been a few events now where people, you know, they have been open, but people have to be tested before they go. But in theory, in this country, th everything, you know, is open after the 21st of June. The, so we have a few festivals in the UK this summer, some of which may go ahead. We don't know. In mainland Europe, it's quite different. They're, they're behind the UK. Most countries, Denmark accepted, are behind the UK on, on vaccination programme, and they're still much more closed. Um, I did have a whole solo tour of socially distanced gigs arranged for June in Germany. That's now been put back to September. I mean, I don't mind. Okay, we can wait. We had a, a whole, you know, all the portal experience behind you. You can wait another few months. Exactly. Right? I mean, everybody said to me, you'll really, really miss, you must really miss playing live. And the strange thing is that after 40 years of doing it, I don't really, you know, I hope, I know that I'll be playing live again at some point. We're very, very lucky that, and privileged that, that when the pandemic hit, for a lot of bands, you know, smaller bands, it this is disaster because you couldn't make money from playing live, or you can't certainly can't money make money from records. So you you know that was that was it. With us, we we played. You know, we don't know what playing is especially. There was enough money for us not to have to worry about not playing live for a year and a half or so. So we're okay. We've been okay. We've used the time. Like I say, I made a solo record last year that. You know, I finished it in in. It was finished by the end, by the turn of the year. I've kind of forgotten about it now, although it's not coming out for another three weeks. Um, and now I've started working on a, a new Metal Army record. Amazing. So after forty one years of of new Model Army, what what remains the same, and and what have you changed about your approach to operating as a band slash business um and and what keeps you motivated i think we said this uh, an early part of the conversation where i basically said you get in a room with somebody else and you make something you think is great <laughs> there's nothing better than that you know uh, that's basically it. I mean, right. you know, I've, I've never been interested in um, uh, trying to please other people. Never been interested in trotting out the same stuff again and again and again. Always been interested in the next idea, the next idea, the next song. Um, and I mean, there's this weird thing about success. You know, when you start in a band, um, you, you talk about making it. Right. You know, your, your fantasy is making it. You look at the successful bands, you think, oh, we, you know, if only we could be like that. But what you really mean is making a living from it. That success, it's, it's, a, it's a line you, that is a line you cross. We crossed it in 1984 um, where we could make a living from it. And the, and we haven't had to cross back since, um, which, which we're you know very lucky. After that, it really doesn't matter. Where are you in the charts this week? How many records do you sell? Who gives a fucking shit? Right. You know, the, the, you look in your fridge. There's food there. Can you pay your rent? Yes, you can. After that, it really doesn't matter. You're on this lifelong exploration of ideas and music. What a wonderful world to live in. How privileged and lucky we are. I think that the great thing about being a creative and and being able to make a living from it is that you have the freedom to avoid the distraction of external work. Like 
to not have to dedicate 40 hours a week of your life to something that you don't care about. Yeah, you're right. It's, and I, that it's sort of strips your soul. We're very lucky. And, it, and I think indirectly, maybe one of the reasons we stayed in Bradford. I mean, I have, you know, here we have, uh, you know, this is where I spend a lot of time working. It's a very nice studio room. Yeah. Uh, this costs us nothing. If right. we were in London, if we we're in London, we'd have to worry about how to pay for it all. Living in Bradford, sure. nothing costs anything really. You know, it, it's, you don't worry about that aspect of things. None of us have expensive lifestyles. Only one of us has children. Um, you know, they're obviously children are expensive. Um, right. Michael, Michael has family life and he's very dedicated to it and uh, it's expensive. But in general, none of us have sort of expensive lifestyles. Are we, are we interested in cars? No, not really. Are we interested in, in you know, expensive holidays? No, not really. Uh, you know, um, you know we, 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 we get by. Right. And we live in a cheap city. And and uh, you're happy creating music that you enjoy to, to play for people. Yeah. How lucky is that? It's a wonder. You know what they say? It's a wonderful life. Yeah. <laughs> very, very much so. <laughs> um, and uh, so you have these festival dates that hopefully will go off, you said, September? um the first one's in july whether that will happen or not i'm not sure there's a couple in august that we're kind of optimistic about um through the autumn we do have a new model army program around europe but i have a sort of feeling it probably won't happen um at the end of the year we have postponed from last year some big double night shows where we play their their 40th anniversary things where we play two sets on the Friday, you know, we play two and a half hours on the Friday and we play two and a half hours, completely different material on the Saturday, which, which allows us to play, you know, 60 different songs over a weekend, um, which is a kind of, uh, you know, from all the different eras of new model army. Um, and that's still only about a quarter long of the show. catalog. Sorry. That's a long show. That's a long show. You know, we'll get through it. We did, we did, we basically did the same 10 years ago. It just allows us to play a decent, you know, representation of the 40 years. I think on, I think when we did it in 2010, we came to Brooklyn, did two nights like that. And we said, we'll do, uh, I think it was four songs from each album. We can't do that now because there's too many albums, but the, <laughs> Know, maybe two songs from each album or something <laughs> you know but but basically we'll we'll play across the you know basically a quarter of the catalog across two nights so wow. we're planning that at the end of the year i think the ones in the uk will happen whether they'll happen in i think amsterdam might happen cologne maybe don't know we did have the other big thing that we had planned for last year and then planned for this year and now planning for next year is we we had that thing that all bands do at some stage in their career, which is do a show with an orchestra, uh, with the Leipzig Symphonia in a big venue in Berlin. That was scheduled for last year Amazing. with Shiran, Shiran Yinon doing the, the orchestral arrangements. Um, and that's, that's happening next year. So uh, we'll do that next year, probably. But I think by next year, we'll have a, there'll be another new Model Army album. So we probably ha won't have to bother with the 40th anniversary shit. We'll get on with the new album. You strike me as a person like me. I mean, you kind of summed it up right there. You're like, we won't have to deal with the 40th anniversary. Let's not deal with the retrospective. And let's, here's something that I just made. Let's the only thing that. we did do during the pandemic last October, we did a... Uh, we did one of these double set shows where we played, I can't remember, 30, 30 odd songs uh, online. We did one single online gig. I mean, everybody said, you know, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were all these people like me, singer, songwriter, sat on a sofa singing songs. And I really didn't want to do that. Right. I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't want to do it. But when the when it became apparent we weren't going to do any any of the 40th anniversary shows we said well let's take our birthday the 23rd of october and we'll do a single long um online gig 
and we said well if we're going to do that we're going to do it properly we're going to do it 100 percent live um and we're going to sell tickets and we're going to have you know a global audience the only the other thing i did like about it was that we had a a kind of chat room at the in the halftime break when people watching in poland could talk to people watching in texas and that was kind of cool um and we had a you know an audience of somewhere we don't really know but somewhere between 10 20 000 people watching um and it we were nervous because it was 100 percent live and we knew that we a we would make mistakes um b you know uh, what happened actually is i lost my voice halfway through because i was really unmatched fit um uh, and all, all, of course all the cameras were pointing at the wrong things uh, you know when someone <laughs> was playing a solo the camera was pointing at the, the other person because we you know everything was unpre-planned right. was, let's just and we said to the camera people take the cameras off the tripods move around just give it some fucking energy because everybody's been sat on their sofa watching perfectly produced tv for months but what they want is something that feels live so we tried to do that and it was quite successful and people liked it. And, and then they said, oh, are you, are you going to do it again? And we like, we like doing things once. There's a show we did three years ago, two, three years ago, where um, called The Night of a Thousand Voices, which was an interesting project, actually, uh, where, you know, every band has had the experience of playing the first verse of a well-known song, um, you know, fairly quietly, and the crowd sing the words. And the band love it, the crowd love it, because that whole thing of communal singing is the most primal, strong, binding form of human culture that there is. And we thought, it's great. Why don't we do a weekend of that? So we did, and I can't... It turns out that I don't think any other band has ever done this, um, which is extraordinary because it seems an obvious thing to me to do. So we hired this amazing place in London, which was circular, sort of old, old church place, hold a thousand, just under a thousand people. We put a stage in the middle. We played with the full band, but we tried to play fairly quietly. A thousand people came in. We issued songbooks at the, on the entry because everybody knows the first verse and the chorus, but nobody knows the third verse. Um, and then we would say, right, now we're going to play uh, that song. And everybody would shuffle through there. You know, we had a 50, 50 songs in this thing, and they shuffle, find the words, and then everybody sang. And it was amazing. Did and, you and uh, basic audio or video capture this? this did uh, audio and primitive video. In the end, we arranged the film properly and, and it all went pear-shaped. So we ended up using quite a lot of people's phone phone footage. But it's got it. We did a, a live, there's a, there's a, it's an album called The uh, Night of a Thousand Voices. We didn't push it, push it, push it. Um, but it does sound amazing. How oh, cool! And at the time, I remember standing there, and we were kind of conscious that it was some. This was something pretty good, um, but it was an experiment. We didn't know it would work. I remember pushing it to the rest of the band, and they weren't sure. And I, I was sure that it would work. But it was when really when we listened back to it and getting people's reactions afterwards, because the audience weren't sure it was going to work either. They were like, <laughs> "What? We're going to go in? We're going to, you know." Uh, sing from a, a songbook but it was that thing of a thousand people singing together songs that they all love is extraordinarily powerful yeah man but you know everybody said oh you must do it again I'm going, no no we did it once it was great move on next project wow uh so you said did you say that you're already working on a new album? Yeah, or? early days. Uh, it's, it's early days, and I don't feel any time pressure, which I really like. You you're know, I was going through the camp. That drum beat, that chord sequence. Let's right. see where we're going. Michael came down a couple of days ago. We played through some ideas. He suggested a few things. Um, Kerry, unfortunately, our bass player lives bloody miles away but he'll be coming back up sometime in the next couple of weeks. And, and so uh, you're able to record, are you 
tracking demos there in yeah, your studio see, yeah, room, just, or or your complete albums are you working on them there no just uh we're making demos yeah. we have made an album here the last album though um was perhaps my favorite ever export recording experience where we we met these two guys called in in 2012 we did an album where we had carry his new bass player um, but he was also a guy. Um, and we had we'd had a bit of a kind of break uh, we had a fire in our studio which destroyed lots of stuff so we had to rebuild the studio um, and we had we'd had a bit of a break and during this time Michael and me had been talking about making something quite different a very studio studio album based around the layering of drums and so we started working on this album in, I think it's 2012. We, we spent a week in a studio in London recording drums before we'd even written the songs, actually, some of them. Um, and then we built this thing together. But we always wanted, we'd sick of making interesting sounding records that are badly mixed. So we thought we'll go to an A-list mixer. And we went to Joe Barese in Los Angeles and he mixed it brilliantly. Um, made this sort of amazing studio, studio album. Um, called uh, Between Dog and Wolf. And then we did another one where we, dis uh, where we discovered these two guys have a studio in Leeds called Lee and Jamie. Um, and we discovered making D uh, Dog and Wolf, the rediscovered the joys of tape, recording on tape and then into a computer rather than direct to a computer. You get this particular sound of tape that nothing else is quite like. Um, and they have a kind of punk rock studio that uses tape. And so we discovered them like this. We made a, 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 an album, another album that Joe Barese mixed. Then we made an album in their studio in Leeds called Winter that they mixed. And the sound of that album, that was about four years ago, just before Trump and just before Brexit vote, we kind of knew what was coming it was very much a zeitgeist album, very claustrophobic, quite aggressive. And it sounds like a very loud band in a very small room because that's exactly what it was. Um, their very small studio. Then, then uh, well, two years ago now, we had this idea to do, we wanted to stay with Lee and Jamie, but we wanted to do a different kind of album. We wanted to be, do an album that was kind of big and open. And in terms of subject matter, was not about um, that. It was really about, you know, everybody in the world is screaming at each other. What we want to do is make an album about not, which is not about taking sides. It's about the things that unite us. It's not us and them. It's about the bigger picture because all this us and them thing, you know, actually, you know, the, the real catastrophe facing, facing us all is ecological. Um, and and stuff about that and just the big open wide open picture and we wanted to make an album which sounded big and open and wide and we decided not to use an awful lot of dirty electric guitars but instead go to somewhere we, where we could have a big drum sound um, and big bass and use mostly clean telecasters and acoustic guitars to leave space. Um, and Lee and Jamie sort of, uh, we started talking about it and they went, we know where we should go. There's this extraordinary studio in, on an island in Norway. And wow. we went, that's deeply impractical and impossibly expensive. <laughs> and then we looked at it and went, no, we've got to do it. And so we went up to Norway for night and we went and recorded this album in nine days there on in this amazing studio where um, it was built on the edge of the, the ocean um, where with, with windows. So you could see while you're recording, you can see the tide coming in and going out. You could surrounded by snow capped mountains, the most extraordinary place I've ever been. And it was an utter labor of love to make this album called From Here. Um, which we did there. And uh, so that, that was the last New Model Army album.
Let me ask you something. All these projects, are they label funded or are you going into your pocket to take We're our, we we are our own label. We license we license through a a, a German label called Ear, Edel Ear Music. Um there there are licensee basically we've done each of the last four or five hour, uh, three four albums we've done through them where but there's no deal with them. Each album we go, well, we like what you did with the last one, so here's another one. So it's our own label. We license through them. I I have deep admiration for your your amb the ambition that you have to do what you want. And, you know, like, like you said, uh, the island studio in Norway it seemed prohibitively and impossibly expensive. You saw it and you were like, fuck it. Yeah, we, we are, well, I remember what, like happened amazing time. That, that what happened is that Lee and Jamie showed it to us and we all went, ah, no, we can't do that. When we started looking around for stu other studio, we wanted, we knew we didn't want to go record in their studio because it is claustrophobic. We yeah. wanted to go somewhere open. But, and Lee phoned me up and went, look, we, you know, you have to do it, it has to be done. It's not as expensive as you think it's possible, blah, blah, blah. And I phoned up everybody in the band knowing, knowing that what we're like as people, that nobody is kind of, you know, everybody's after this as a kind of, you know, that everybody would say, yes, it has to be done. It was a little bit like the fact on the last day in Norway, we'd been staring at the sea for days it was March, it was snowy, it was bloody freezing. But we knew we had to go in the sea. You just had to. <laughs> you know, it's like, it has to be done. So, of course, on the last day, we all just threw our clothes off and ran into the sea. And it was fucking freezing, but it had to be done. You know, it's you like that. polar bared it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. I don't know. The sea was about, I think it was three degrees or something. Uh, wow. It's fucking cold. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It has to be done, right? And in the end, uh, we all die. Yep, we'll, we'll all go away. We'll all we'll all return to the earth. And Fine by me. And uh, yeah, me too. Uh, you know, our life's experiences are really what matter, and and. I guess the I feel like happiness and joy are things that if you cultivate then then it grows around you. And I, if you are uh, hyper aware of if all you focus on is money and things I th but I don't think life is you know there is this American thing the, the pursuit of happiness. There's one thing you can say about happiness for for sure. That is, if, if you pursue it, you'll never get it. Right. It's not something you can pursue. It's like, and, and it's absolutely a modern idea, this life, idea that life should be happy. And if you're not happy, there must be something wrong with you. And you must take this, make these changes to your life or, or take this drug or, or something. I don't think that's, it's like that at all. I'm sure that life is much more like those kind of cloudy days well, they just go along. You'll have very bleak times occasionally, but every now and again, you'll get that shaft of sunlight that will break through the clouds. And th those moments come. For um, sure. I guess what I meant more was if you would, ha you would be sitting here regretting not jumping in the ocean or regretting not going to that studio if you hadn't chose that. And I guess in in making those decisions and in in choosing to have the life that you've you've led for fifty years as a as a teen and adult, uh, is is a kind of happiness because you're doing what you want and not what is expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That idea, I mean, I, it's that idea of, of another very Western idea, freedom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't have any illusions. Freedom to, 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 to find your path through. 
don't know, there's a million different paths. We all take take the path we take. Um, there's all sorts of other paths that might have been better. Do I have regrets of things that I didn't do? Uh, yeah, I've got quite a lot of regrets, actually. Um, but it doesn't seem any point in dwelling on them. No. No, I don't think so. You move forward. Mm. I've had a really great time talking with you. Uh, me too. I'm, just, I'm sorry I talk so much. No, I'll tell you what, what always happens is that 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 when I start doing these kind of interview things, when you, you release an album, you start doing interviews um, because someone arranges them for you, you know, some someone nice from Adel. And um, the, the, the people ask you questions and you start finding answers and then you get used to talking. And then somebody asks you one question, like you, I'm sure you asked me one question, and I just go. <laughs> you know that is uh, that's the best kind of conversation for me to have because other, you know, no one wants to hear me talk. <laughs> well, maybe they do. Maybe they do. But then if you've got a listenership that's heard to, heard you talking for a while, but I don't know. I don't know what your listenership is. My listeners have heard my seven stories. <laughs> um well the generally listeners of new model army have heard my seven stories you know? uh um I, I wish you the best of luck this year getting uh getting to get back to to work even though you're not as excited as maybe uh uh as uh, uh many other folks I, I know a lot of people are chomping at the bit um, I know that you you're going to be happy when you're performing again. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I wish you the best of luck with this record. Tell, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to keep my eyes open for the next time you come to the states. Yeah, really we, like will, we will definitely come back somehow, somewhere, in some shape or form. And hell, I might be. You know, I do a bit of traveling. I'm just keep my eyes peeled. Well, Keep if you're my not in New York, I'm sure we'll be in New York. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for giving me so much time on a weekend. Um, I I really had a great time talking with you. Cheers. Uh, you're fucking great. Good. Good luck with your show. Thank you so much, man. And all those lovely guitars on the wall behind you. Hey, I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, I, so I don't like I don't like to use luck, but uh, yeah, yeah, use it. I'm fortunate. Yeah, luck. It's luck. A lot of it is luck. Life is a series of <laughs> missing the slippery bits. That's what my life is—a series of missing the slippery uh, footsteps. So, uh, thank okay. you so much, man. Have a great weekend. Okay. Cheers. Take care.